being here for the next six weeks as we look to God's word about how to fight for our families. We're watching the family units slip away household by household. And we can fight as Christians. It's time to take up that armor of God and, and to fight for our families. We're going to end on Mother's Day in a very special way. So, so you, you need to be here to be a part of it, to see that, and to be a part of that series. But right now, we're, we want to look at, at our risen Savior. So turn in your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 20. That's where we're going to be, John chapter 20. And as we can think about it, I mean, this is just a great day. It's Easter. It's the day that we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. The day that, that they found out that Jesus was alive. And it's a day for us to gather together. And I'll tell you what, as I stood up here looking over you guys, you all look good. And you were singing, well, most of you were singing, some of you don't sing, but, but you know, just having a great, great time as we serve that risen Savior. But you know, as I think about the fact that Jesus lives, I think there's not enough hours in the day just to, to talk about our living Savior. There's not enough words in the English language to describe the fact that the, the Son of God took on flesh and blood, suffered in every way known to mankind, in every way that man is tempted. He, as an innocent man, died on a criminal's cross for the purpose of paying the debt for sin for all mankind. He was buried, and three days later, proving that he had defeated death, he defeated hell, and he defeated that grave, he came back to life. We don't have enough time today to talk about that because that's the excitement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's what, the, that's what Jesus did. John records the story of his resurrection this way. In John chapter 20, start with me in verse 1. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in this place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Mary, however, stood there and cried as she looked at the tomb. As she cried, she bent over and looked inside. She saw two angels in white clothes. They were sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. One angel where, was where Jesus' head had been. The other was where his feet had been. The angels asked why, was, why she was crying. Mary told them, they've removed my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. After she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. However, she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus asked her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Mary thought it was the gardener speaking to her, so she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll remove him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, the word which means teacher. Jesus told her, don't hold on to me. I have not yet gone to the Father, but go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I am going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary from Magdala went to the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. She also told them what he had said to her. From this passage this morning, I want us to see three different things at the tomb that first Easter morning. The first thing I want us to see, I want us to see Mary at the tomb. And as we look at Mary at the tomb, there's a couple things we need to, to look at in her story. We need to first look at Mary's discovery. Our passage tells us that the very early in the morning, it was still dark outside, Mary went to the tomb. Now, we know from the other Gospels she wasn't alone. Uh, in John's Gospel, it just talks about Mary, but, but the others talk about other ladies that went with her, and Joanna and the other Mary and some other ladies. We don't even know their name. And, and they, they're going, and their purpose was they wanted to add spices to the body of Jesus. 
Now, I can tell you, much of my life, I heard preachers say that, that the reason they came to add spices was because they'd done the job so hastily when he died because they was heading into the Passover, and, and so they had, they had to get it done so they could get home. And that's not true. When our Bible records how much spices they used originally, they used plenty. These ladies just went to, to add more spices, and, and I think we see the reasons because they loved him so much. They just, they just wanted to do something for him. They missed him that much. And as they went to the tomb, they're discussing, you know, how are they going to remove this heavy rock? Because, you see, the graves that they were way different than what we do today. They didn't really, they buried in the ground, but not like down in the ground like we do. They would dig caves into the rock. And they would usually put a shelf in there for the body, and that's where they would place the body of the dead. And then they would take a huge stone, a lot like what we might think of a millstone. And they would place it over the entrance of that hole, and, and it would usually be on a little uphill slide, and they'd remove the wedge, and, and then it would roll down into place and just totally block the entrance to that tube. And so, so these ladies, on their, their way, they're discussing, how are we going to remove this heavy stone? But when they arrive at the tomb, the stone's already been moved. Our scripture tells us there was an earthquake, and, and, and so, so they, the stone is gone. From the rest of the story, we, we kind of get the idea that Mary still doesn't understand. They get to the tomb, the stone's gone, but they look and they find out the, stone, the tomb is also empty. The body of Jesus isn't there. Now, because we know the whole story, we start rejoicing. But they didn't understand at that time. I mean, Mary still doesn't understand. She thinks somebody stole the body. So she's weeping, she's crying, she's going to tell the disciples somebody's taking him. She runs back to where the disciples were and tells them the tomb's empty. And then our passage tells us that Peter and John take off running to the tomb. Now, now I love this story because I, I really think I can associate with Peter in a couple ways that we see here. They take off running. Our Bible says that John got there first. That's why I would associate with Peter. Because I don't know how, how far it was, but I probably couldn't have ran all that way. And, and, and you just, I'd have got there, but I'd have come a hug, chugging and a huffing and a puffing. And, and, and I'd have, so that's kind of like Peter. Well, they get there. Well, John, he gets to the tomb, but he stops. Well, the second way I think I'm a lot like Peter is Peter don't think. He just does. He gets to the tomb, and he just busts right on inside. And then later, John comes in, and what they see is the grave cloths are there. Even the napkin that covered his head was, was folded and was laying there. But Jesus wasn't there. And our Bible says they believed that Jesus rose from the dead, but they still didn't understand. So they left. And Peter and John went back to where they were staying. But according to the passage, Mary stayed there at the tomb. And as she remained, I think that shows us our next thing about Mary. So we saw Mary's discovery. I think the second thing we see is Mary's devotion. She stayed there and she's weeping. She still didn't understand that Jesus had risen from the dead. He told him he was going to. But, but she hadn't read. I mean, so the only thing she knows is he's gone. And she's there weeping. And, and, and you say, well, why, why was she weeping? Why was she, you know, the, he's not even there. Why is she weeping? I think there's a couple reasons. Number one is I, I think she just loved Jesus. She loved him so much. And, and she, she missed him. She saw him die. She was one of those that stood there and watched him die on the cross. And she weeps. Jesus had done so much in her life. Jesus had delivered her from a life of deep and, and dreadful sin. Mark tells us in his gospel that, that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. So she's weeping. But I think there's a second reason why she's weeping. And I think that second reason is right now Mary's looking at the physical. She, she's looking, not the spiritual, she's looking at the physical. What she saw was an empty tomb. She knew that he died. She knew that they put him in there. She knew the guys that had wrapped him up in the spices and knew everything about putting him in there and knew, knew that's where and he was going. So as she looks on the physical, the only thing that made sense to her was somebody stole his body. So I think she's weeping because she's looking for the... It never dawned on her that Jesus was alive. You know, and that kind of sounds a lot like us today. I believe there are a lot of God's children today who need to realize that Jesus is alive. And we see that a lot of times in our Christian lives because as Christians, we get really discouraged. 
And when we get discouraged, we get disgruntled. And, and when we get disgruntled, you know, we become unhappy. And, and then nothing pleases us. And, and we see it. We see it in Christians a lot. Nothing makes them happy. It's too hot or it's too cold in the church. I don't like the music. I don't like the way people dress. And, and the list just goes on and on and on because we fail. We look to the physical and fail to see the spiritual that Jesus is alive. So as we look at Mary, she's weeping, but she's not yet realized that Jesus is alive. So we see Mary at the tomb, but the second picture I want to give you, I want you to see the messengers at the tomb. So as we look there, the, the Bible tells us about these angels, or it says men in white. Some translations do say angels. And, and they're there, and when Mary looks back inside, they're, they're sitting right where the body of Jesus had been. One where the head was and one where his feet was. And as we look at it, I want us to look at two aspects here. First of all, I want you to see their presence. John is very specific in telling us there were two angels. And that's really significant. For us, we would kind of look over that. that you know, okay, there was two. One set on his head, one set on his feet. Okay, Jesus is alive. Let's just focus there. But, but for everybody who read that in John's day, that would be very, very significant. Because when we look at it, in the Old Testament, the law said for something to be true, for something to be determined as true, there had to be two witnesses. And they had to state the same identical thing. So you know what God is telling us here with the fact that there's two angels in that tomb? It's true. Jesus is alive. And when they said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is alive. Matthew tells us that, that one of the angels, when the stone was rolled away, was sitting on top of the rock. And I think that's pretty cool as well. I've often looked at that. And, you know, God rolled that stone away, and that angel's just sitting there going, okay, Satan, try to put it back. Because we need to understand something. The stone was not removed for Jesus to get out. Jesus was alive. He's out. The stone was removed so that we could know that, that he was out. The stone was removed so that we could get in, so that we could see the evidence of the empty tomb. So I, I think, you know, but here there's two angels, and John makes sure we know there's two because he's telling us this witness is true. But there's something else I want you to see about those angels, those messengers in the tomb. Not just their presence, I want you to see their posture. What does John tell us that they're doing? They're sitting. They're sitting. Now I want you to stop and think for a moment. Just, just put on your this makes sense hat. If the Son of God who was killed, if somebody had taken his body, do you think the angels of God would be sitting? No, they're not. They would be up and, and they would be searching. I mean, they would know where he, uh, they would find that body. So here's what it tells us by the fact that they're sitting. Everything is okay. Sitting is a posture of peace. So what they're telling to, 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 to Mary, to anybody that comes, that, that it's okay. It's a time of peace. And the picture that we have this morning is that picture of peace. Jesus is alive. So we look at the angels. We look at Mary. But I want us to see a third one of the two. And the third one we need to see is the Messiah at the tomb. We need to see the fact that Jesus was there too. As Mary's weeping and, and she, she, she talks to the angels, the angels say, why are you weeping? And, and, and when she turns around, there's Jesus. Now the Bible says she didn't know it was Jesus at that time. Some have said it's because of the tears in her eyes. Some have said it was hidden from her. I really don't know why. But, but here's what I know. I know when she turned around, there's Jesus. And there's a lot that we can focus on this morning. We could take the rest of the day looking at the fact that Jesus was there in our life. We could look at the fact that, that when he spoke her name, it says when, she, when he called her by name, when he said Mary, her eyes were open. And you know when he speaks each of our names, when he places that call to our lives and specifically calls us out to follow him, our eyes are open to our sin, and we choose whether we turn from that sin to follow him or not. 
So, so he speaks her name, and we can look at that. We can look at the fact that he told her, don't cling to me because I'm not yet went to the, to the Father. A lot of pastors have tried to explain that passage, and, and we could look at a lot of things there. But, but here's the thing I want us to focus on. We started in the month of March looking at questions that Jesus asked. And throughout this month, we've been looking at questions Jesus asked. Matter of fact, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's recorded 307 questions asked by Jesus. In our passage this morning, there's two. So as we look at the Messiah at the tomb, I want us to focus on those two questions, more the second than the first. But the two questions, you find them in verse 15, look at it, here's what it says. Jesus asked, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? <coughs> Up until that point, Mary had only been able to see through worldly eyes. She saw an empty tomb. And through worldly eyes, the only explanation that she had was somebody has stolen the body. She saw a man before her, but through worldly eyes, she thought it was a gardener. What Mary had to do was very needed to transfer her trust from what she thought was possible to what was possible through Jesus. That, that's what needs to take place here. From what she thought possible to what is possible through Jesus. Without Christ, the only possible explanation was somebody took the body. They hid the body. But with Christ, Jesus is alive. So as, as we ask that question, who are you looking for? She had to learn to look through spiritual eyes. In today's world, everybody's seeking. We might not even realize we are, but, but every single one of us, in some way or another, we are seeking. We, we are trying to find. And as we're seeking, if we're only looking through world eyes, we're only going to seek what's possible for us. But we have to transfer that from looking through worldly eyes to looking through spiritual eyes. We have to be able to see not what's possible with us, but what's possible through Jesus. Let me give you an example. And, and I think the best example would be salvation. Everybody wants eternal life. I mean, I, if you ask anybody, you know, do you, want, do you want to go to heaven? I don't care who you are. Everybody's going to say yes. We want to go to heaven. But unfortunately, a lot of folks, when they think about heaven, they look at heaven as I have to get there through what's possible with me. So what do they do? They try to be good. They try to do good deeds. They try to help one another. They try to say nice things. They, they try to do all the things that would define them as a good person. Because if we're looking through worldly eyes, we're looking at what's possible through us. But salvation isn't possible through us. No matter how good we are, no matter how good you are this morning, the Bible says we are still sinners. We fall short of that mark of perfection that God has set for us. God says, be like me. I'm perfect. I don't care how good you are. We're not perfect. We all sin. Whether we do one sin or whether we do a million sins, we're all sinners. And when we try to do what's possible with us, we fall short. So what we have to do is we have to transfer that thought process from it's impossible for me to what is possible for Christ. Because Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins. He paid the price for it. His blood covers our sins, allowing us to believe on him, and that be enough for eternal life. Does that make sense? Not from a human mindset, not through worldly eyes, but through spiritual eyes, we see everything is possible through Jesus Christ. So when Jesus asked, what are you looking for? Mary had to say, or who are you looking for? Mary had to transfer that trust from, from worldly eyes to spiritual eyes. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the, the night before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, and then they came to arrest him and took him to trial after trial before he ended up before Pilate and, and, and then Herod and, and back to Pilate and before the cross. Uh, that night before all that happened, 
Jesus is in an upper room with his disciples. Just the twelve. Jesus is going to leave pretty quick. But he's there with just them. And they're observing together the Passover meal. But as they do, Jesus kind of changes things up a little bit. Jesus does something in that meal that they were so used to to help them to understand that they had to learn not to look through worldly eyes, but they had to look at what Jesus could do. Not what's possible for us, but what's possible for Jesus. And that night, as he, he did what we call the Lord's Supper, some call it communion, what he did was show them, this is how salvation is possible through me. And the way he showed them was salvation comes through my body and my blood. Matthew records it this way. Matthew 26, starting at verse 26. says, excuse me, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed them. He broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. Then he took a cup and spoke a, spoke a prayer of thanksgiving. He gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of promise. It is poured out for many people so that sins are forgiven. I can I guarantee that I won't drink this wine again until the day when I drink new wine with you in the Father's kingdom. No matter how we try to figure it out, it is not possible for sinful humans to go to heaven. It's not possible for anything that we can do on our own. We fall short. But Jesus made a way. And he made a way in his body and his blood. This morning as you come in out on the table, each of you took a cup. I want to go ahead and take that cup and, and take it in your hand. And, and if you would, go ahead and just pull back that top layer, layer. And in that top layer, you find a piece of bread. Take that piece of bread and just kind of hold it in your hands for a moment. And as you do, I want you to remember, Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus had to suffer. He had to suffer in every way. He suffered in ways that we can't even imagine. If we just looked at the suffering on the cross, well, we, we know the pain and the agony there. But, but, but while he was on this earth, he suffered in every way that we would suffer and then suffer. For our salvation, Jesus had to suffer. But he said, this is my body, which is broken. So I want you now, I want you to imagine that this is the suffering of Jesus. And I want you to take that piece of bread and just break it in two. And the reason I had you do that is because of your suffering. But because of, of your sin, Jesus had to suffer. So, so it was we. It wasn't the Roman soldiers. It wasn't the Jewish leaders. It was you and I, the sinful humans, who, who caused that suffering. But he said, take that and eat it, because this is my body, which is broken for you. So I want to ask you this morning, go ahead and take that bread. And as born again believers, eat of that bread. Amen. So when the meal was over, in that same, same meal, when the meal was over, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a New Testament of my blood. It's a new covenant. And what he was telling them was, it was his blood that would be shed for them. His blood that would cover their sins. Jesus asked the question, who are you looking for? And folks, every person in this room, every person that we know, every person that will ever live is seeking something. God created unto us that desire to seek. The question is, who are we looking for? Are we looking for what is possible through us? Or are we looking to Jesus and what is possible through him? We cannot achieve heaven. But Jesus gives it to us freely. And the way that he did was because he went to a cross and he died. And gave his blood as a sacrifice.
so that you and I could have eternal life. He said, as often as you take this bread and drink of this cup, you do so to show my death until it comes. So together this morning, let's take and drink. Amen. So one question remains. As we participate in the Lord's Supper, as we share in that breaking of bread and, and, and the drinking of that cup, we ask the big question, who are you looking for? Because you see, it comes down to us. And I believe with the crowd the size we have this morning that there's probably folks that are still looking for what is possible for them. What they can do there's probably still folks here that are trying to earn their way to heaven. And just like everybody else, you're falling short. You can't be good enough. You can't buy it. You can't, you, you can't earn it. It's not possible. So my question is, will you change the way you're looking and look to Jesus and say, it's not possible through me, but Jesus, I trust you. And our Bible tells us that, that that's just the, the fact that we believe in Him. By faith, we accept the fact that Jesus can, even though we can't. And maybe this morning, your prayer needs to be that prayer of salvation. To say, Lord Jesus, I can't save myself. I've tried everything, and I fall short. But I believe that because you died on the cross, because you were buried and you rose again the third day, that I can have everlasting life through you. So today, Lord, I transfer my trust to you. Maybe today you're here and, and you, you've prayed that prayer. And, and you believe that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. But right now, you're not following him. You're not living the life that he wants you to live. Then maybe your prayer today needs to be saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Because I've reverted back to what's possible with me. And I'm living my life for me. There's this area of my life that, that I'm not living for you. So today, I ask your forgiveness and I transfer that to you. Maybe today is the day of rededication. And knowing that everything is possible with Christ, even though it's not possible with us, maybe there's something going on in your life that your prayer needs to be, Lord Jesus, I can't handle this. It's too much for me. But today I give that to you. Here's the question. Who are you looking for? Are you looking for what's possible with you? Or are you looking for what's possible? I hope today that when you leave this place, your answer is, I'm looking for Jesus. And in a moment, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I invite you to just pray along with me. And, and just pray your prayer to say, Lord Jesus, I, I need to transfer this to you. Maybe it's your life. Maybe it's your actions. Maybe, maybe it's that problem right now in your house. But give that to him. And as we sing, if you want to, let's make this our altar. And just come and kneel at this altar and say, God, I, I not only transfer, I give it to you. I place it on the altar and here it is. But God, today, I'm looking for Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for all you do in our lives. But Lord, thank you for the most for sending Jesus. For dying on the cross for each of us so that we might have eternal life. For paying that price for our salvation so that we can be free of sin. And God, I pray for every person that's here today. Because Lord, there may be one, there may be two, there may be many that are still trying to, to trust in themselves. I pray today that their prayer is, I'm looking for Jesus. And I will follow him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand up, please, and sing the people.